All right, you can see my screen? Yeah. All right, so uh, yeah, I, kinda, I just kind of want to motivate um, the pure script uh, effects library, which I think is pretty neat. Let me find it again. Pure script fetch. This is uh, one of Brightfold's libraries um, made, uh, I don't know, maybe about a year ago. Um, I think it's supposed to be similar to a Haskell library called uh, Haxel. Um, yeah, but it's uh, for fetching data and deduplicating a batch net. And you can do other stuff like caching. Um, but yeah, yeah that, that's all pretty enticing, right? <laughs> so I, I kind of want to like, have a motivation for a uh, set of context in which that might make sense. Um, so if you've ever used uh, like HTTP requests in PureScript, um, something like AFJAX, then you like uh, make some, here's, here's the, set the type, type, type signature up here. You'll give it a URL and, it, uh, uh, and uh, a return type that it can decode um, and it'll do that. And th this, is, this itself is like a little bit confusing, so AFJAX, because like usually the best option, the best instance for respondable to return is like the string instance. And then from there you just do your own decoding. Like you just decode the string into something. Um, right. Um, yeah, so it's like a URL thing. But um, let's see. Yeah, so like here's, uh, like so then how, how much you use that? You might do like man equals do, and you get something. Um, and then you say that it's a uh, uh, AFJAX of type something, and um, give it the URL to fetch string, and then you do some decoding, uh, like that user equals decode it. Yeah, it's like this, and then that would be of type. Uh, like uh, either something, <laughs> yeah, because that like that, that that's how decoding works. Anyways, that, that, that that's all that. Um, so that gives rise to the motivation for maybe you just want to encapsulate like all of the fetching and the decoding into one one step. Um, yeah, so then you'll have a, like, the arguments, and then you'll just construct that URL with the arguments, and um, get the user using fjax. Um, I'm not sure what one end that would be in. F, right? Yeah, so then you get that. Um, right, so then like it's just becoming more and more abstracted away from uh, the actual uh, uh, mechanism used to fetch the data. Um, so Pure script uh, fetch kind of has the idea of uh, abstracting out, like having the concept of just a single resource that you can query against. Um, and I, I, that's uh, it was, like if you just go right into the the fetch library, it's a little bit hard to understand. <laughs> so I made a, a library that's a more simple version that's easier to understand, and it removes like the batching and the fetching and stuff, um, which you can add later. So you can see my great library here. <laughs> it's very extensive. Um, but right, so the idea is that given some key, you can get uh, the value. Um, and usually you, it's going to be in some context in the end. Um, so like an example of a key then. Let me find an example. Um, here's a test. So if you have a data type user and you want a user in the end, um, and then here's the parameters uh, um, to a function that returns a user, uh, you want, like, given a user's first name, you can get uh, the rest of that user's information as uh, a record. Um, and then here's a, like a dummy, like imagine on the server side there's a dummy database and it has a several records, and um, so if you make an instance of simple resource for uh, the user and uh, the user response, then th like th this becomes your simple resource, and um, 
then you can just call get resource on anything that has uh, the resource type. And then um, it kind of guarantees that uh, you'll, you'll get some response out of that. Um, right, and then we can add uh, caching on top of this by, let me make another, let me clone this. So if we change this M, this uh, monad that the value is in, if we change this from just like a simple uh, F monad, uh, where, which you would send the HTTP, HTTP request across to uh, like uh, a state monad or uh, like kind of wrap that up, then you can um, uh, cache the responses from these. So here I made an example where uh, I define a new data type so that any data type that you put inside here, um, as long as it's, uh, it also has a simple resource instance, then you can cache this in local storage and browser. Um, right. So there should be a, a get, so you get resource, and then when you get it back, you uh, put it in some key in local storage. Yeah, so, so that's how all that works. Um, but then, like the interesting thing that PureFetch, uh, the, the fetch adds on top of that is, it also has the resource class here. So, given uh, instead of just a single key, you give it you know any number of keys. You can have just a single key in the set, and it will give you back all of those. Um, like for each key, it'll associate the actual uh, data associated with that key. Um, yeah, so that kind of makes sense. Uh, so then how would you use that is you do uh, fetch. Uh, so fetch is um, how you send the request, so to, so to speak. So instead of actually, send, instead of um, returning uh, the, the HTTP request, it would uh, return a data structure that represents that represents that uh, fetch operation. Um, right, so if, it, it, so if you uh, fetch one thing and then fetch the next thing, um, yeah, man, I'm really unorganized, I apologize. But yeah, uh, th then the um, applicative instance will join, or the, yeah, it will join the uh, keys and join the values um, once they are, uh, before they're sent and when they come back again. Because the keys represent uh, before you send the request, and then the values here represent the values afterwards. Um, and because uh, we are putting the key into the map and taking it back out again um, in the same operation, uh, we can unsafe, uh, we can safely uh, it, like look up this key from the map because we are putting it into the map, so we know it's, like we're associating the set of keys with the uh, keys and values, this map. So it, it, this, this is a safe operation, looking up the key. Um, uh, yeah, and then we have to run that uh, data structure which represents the queries. We run that, and uh, then we can, like, put it in some base one add like the effect or af again. Um, yeah, so I wish I had spent more time to organize this, but uh, yeah, it requires all the keys in the request are also in the response. And right, we, we know which keys are in this map because uh, we put it in there. <laughs> it's like associated with the same data structure. Um, yeah, and, I, and uh, yeah, key preservation is probably one of the laws of um, any uh, yeah any instances you make of this. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so you can do a server server side do a single SQL query to fetch lots of users uh, with the same first name, and then you can use the applicative to ensure that there's only a single request. Um, yeah, and there's another um, thing that I'd like to look into, which is uh, using the final tag list style. So here's a nice blog post uh, just optimizing final tag list. So instead of using type classes to represent the operations in a, a final tag list algebra, um, the idea is to put those operations in a record. Um, and then the uh, you, you param parameterize over the functor. And then if you choose this to be that identity functor, that's fine. If you choose this to be uh, some map, like a map from key to values, then it uh, can do batching for you in this algebra. So if you uh, get uh, some string, then you put that string into this map, and then that same map is associated with the um, well, if you, if you put something into this map, then this get operation pulls it out of the map again. So you can use it to build up a, a I think you can use this for uh, deduplicating also, this same technique. So yeah, it's um, multiple uh, ways to do the same deduplicating technique. It boils down to using a map and, uh, and a set to do some optimizations before you send the uh, query and get the response. Um, but yeah, that's. I think that's all I can really say about this library at this time. I didn't spend a lot of time organizing some nice examples. Apologies. Mm-hmm. Cool stuff. I have like a really stupid example of when I used at least Hexel. Like I I used it to look up a bunch of uh, weather information in the past. And so I had like these lists of like duplicated keys and whatever. And then I shoved them into the Yahoo curl. Yahoo query thing, and I did this like fake SQL syntax that you can build up and get a bunch of results back, and I split out from that. So I think that JavaScript version would probably be a lot easier to use. Why is that? The PureScript com uh, compared to the Haxel version? Well, Haxel version comes with like a bunch of things you have to do. Um, um, just remember it being like a lot of confusing boilerplate. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, Harrison, did you want to talk about? Uh Programs as proofs? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, cool. I'll uh, share my screen. No, that's not it. That's the one I want to share. Um, yeah, I was just adding some stuff to this earlier. Um, yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about, uh, or I guess, over the past few months, I've been reading a lot of uh, Harry Martin Luce stuff. Um, and if, if you don't know who he is, he's a Swedish logician um, who basically invented an uh, intuitionistic type theory um, and was one of the first people to sort of like, um, I think technically, uh, William Howard and de Brown were the first to invent dependent types, because I guess de Brown was doing it not a math, but. Um, is one of the first people to work with dependent types. Um, and he gives a very clear explication of, um, of what's essentially the Curry Howard correspondence, uh, of how we can interpret propositions as types, or types as propositions, and uh, programs as proofs. 
Um, and so uh, I guess in the 83 CNA lectures, um, which is uh, published is on the meanings of logical constants and the justifications of logical laws. Um, he talks about uh, the, well, he basically gives justifications for um, all of the logical connectives of intuitionistic logic. So it's stuff like, um, you know, and, so you say A and B, if A and B are propositions, then you have A and B. If A or B, you have like not A, you have A implies B. Um, and then you have uh, predicate logic is where um, you really start getting into dependent types because in order to express something like, you know, um, there exists X such that P of X, um, you need to go from the value level to the, to the type level to express that predicate. Um, so I'm just uh, gonna talk about the propositional part of that. So no dependent types will come into play. Um, I might talk a little bit more about it at the end. Um, so, yeah, so in order to, to explain all of uh, the intuitionistic propositional calculus, um, we need to talk about implication and conjunction and disjunction, and uh, we also need to talk about bottom, or I guess if you want, like the opposite of the tautology, right? It's uh, always false. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk about, I guess, formation rules and elimination rules for each of them, or introduction and elimination rules. Um, so I guess, like, to start with, um, what Martin Luce says is uh, sort of a, a key feature of his program is, like, the distinction between a, a judgment and a proposition. So a judgment is just like an object of knowledge. So if we say something like A is a proposition, where A is some variable, um, that's a judgment. If we say something like the proposition A is true, that's another form of judgment. Um, and I guess the, the second thing that we want to introduce that I didn't totally write up is um, there's there's two kinds of judgments, really. Or there's, no, there's like more, there's lots of kinds of judgments, right? You have stuff like, uh, a is a proposition, A is true. If you're doing type theory, you have more judgments. Um, like, uh, little a is a term of type A. Um, you also have judgments that express that two types are equal um, and that two terms of a given type are equal. Um, but we're not going to get into those today because those like, require uh, much more hardcore stuff that you can't totally get into your script. Um, you probably could do most of it in an address if you wanted to, but uh, so the other um, like dimension that we want to consider when we're talking about judgments is uh, the difference between a categorical judgment and a hypothetical judgment. Um, and I guess this is sort of where the first connection with uh, programming comes in. So a categorical judgment is something that's like always true, right? You can say that, um, you know, proposition A is always true, or you know, if you want, like, an explicit example, you could say that, like, uh, I don't know, there's a cat that uh, just disappeared. It, I think it'd be fun to uh, do a bunch of propositions about my cat, but um, you won't apparently to start it with them. But you know, like the categorical proposition might be my cat is cute, um, or my cat is big, he's a big boy. Um, a hypothetical judgment would be something like if I have a cat, then my cat is big. Um, it's not. I don't, there's better ways of explaining it. So a hypothetical judgment is like we have some hypotheses that we don't know yet, right? So for instance, we might not know whether or not I have a cat, um, but we can conclude that if I do have a cat, that I have to buy cat food, right? So um, the, the way that we go from hypothetical judgments to categorical judgments is we say that a hypothetical judgment is true if like the, um, 
substitution of the terms. Like if we substitute proofs of the hypotheses into like the form of the judgment, um, then we say that, and, and it's true then, then we can get the, the we say that the hypothetical judgment is true. Um, this is sort of weird and philosophical, um, and it's a little bit tricky to talk about. But um, so the judgments that we'll be talking about today are basically just judgments of the type, um, you know, something's a proposition and something's true. Uh, and we do have hypothetical judgments, um, and we're going to write them. We'll talk about it a little more later on. Um, but so I guess the first thing that we start off with, the first thing that Martin Lewis starts off with, is uh, how we form implications and what counts as a verification of an implication. So what Martin Lewis says is, well, how do we know, what does it mean to say that A is a proposition? And the answer that he gives, and this is like going back to, um, actually he talks about how this goes back to Wittgenstein even um, in the Tractatus. But, uh, Something is a proposition if we know what we count as a proof of it or as evidence for it. Um, so in order to say, in order to like give a rule that says that A is a proposition, we have to explain, in order to build a proposition from other propositions, like we have to explain how the proofs of the original propositions will relate to a, a proof of the new proposition. Um, so the first rule is that if we know that a and B are propositions. Uh, we know that A implies B is a proposition, right? Um, and little side nitpicky side note: we don't actually need to know that B is a proposition. We just need to have the hypothetical judgment that B is a proposition, given that we know that A is true. But like, um, that's a dependently typed notion, basically. So we're not going <laughs> to worry about it. Um, so a verification of uh, A implies B is like a hypothetical judgment that A is true under the assumption, uh, or sorry, this is wrong, that B is true under the assumption that A is true, um, which is to say that if we have a verification of A, we can produce a verification of B, which is to say that we have a function from verifications of A to verifications of B. Um, so we also have the, the introduction rule, right, which is that if we know that B is true on the hypothetical that A is true, we know that A implies B is true. Uh, so this is just a restatement of what we said above, of what counts as a verification of A implies B. Um, and so finally we get to some pure script, right? And it's actually really simple, right? So the idea is that, um, let's go down some, uh, we have this proof of implication introduction rule. And the way it works is that we have this hypothetical judgment uh, on A, we can judge B and we transform it into um, an implication. Uh, and in PureScript, all we have to do is just like use the identity function, right? Because there's essentially no difference, is what Martin Luth is saying, between um, this hypothetical judgment here and this implication here. Um, so the other thing is that like, Pure script, right? We basically have this one function type constructor, and it's like severely overloaded when we're talking about logic. Um, so here, uh, the first time we use it in this type signature, it's hypothetical judgment, right? It's hypothetical judgment that B is true given that A is true. The second time we use it in type signature, um, what it's doing is separating the premises of this inference rule from the conclusion. And here, it's the intuitionistic implication logical connector, right? It's saying A implies B. Um, uh, I thought about rewriting this to use like separate symbols for all of these and like actually go into the plumbing a little bit and like translate between them um, explicitly. Uh, I know Brightfold did something like that uh, in the, the substructural library, um, but I don't know. I started working on that and it was a lot of work and it made things look a lot more confusing. So I figured it really wasn't worth it, but that's like. Um, it's something that you could do if you wanted to be more rigorous about this stuff. Um, uh, the other thing that we use it for in this 
here is that we can separate the premises of the inference rules uh, from each other as well, um, instead of just the premises from the conclusion. Um, so we also have the elimination rule for implication, right, which is uh, also known as modus ponens. And it says that if we know that A implies B is true, and we know that A is true, we know that B is true as well. Um, and justification for this is that A implies B is nothing more than a way to go from a verification of A to a verification of B. And all we have to do is like apply our knowledge um, that A implies B to our knowledge that A, right? And so in pure script, right, it literally is just verification. Um, so if we have a proof that A implies B, and then we have a proof that A, all we have to do is like apply the first to the second, right? And we get this type of integer, which is that if A implies B, uh, and we'll be careful here, this first function arrow is, again, just uh, the implicational connective. Um, here, it's separating the two premises of the inference rule. So like, bracket these two off, these are the premises. And then this guy is introducing the conclusion, which is that B is true. I think that the different means of these arrows is very interesting. I'm not quite sure the the difference uh, between like a hypothetical judgment and an implication. Logical. Yeah, it's like I think in the propositional calculus there really isn't a difference. Um, when you start dealing with other forms of judgment, like like if you want to talk about type equality, uh, then there really is like a difference that you need to worry about. But if we're just talking about propositional logic, then um, sort of the rules of implication introduction and um, also implication elimination, right? Basically say that it's kosher to move back and forth between uh, hypothetical judgments and logical implication. <clears throat> uh, which I'm saying right here, right? Um, another way to look at this is if we only know A implies B, then we have this like hypothetical judgment, right? Because if we also had A, then we could use this elimination rule to move to B. So if we have A implies B, then we have a hypothetical judgment uh, of given A, we can conclude B. Um, like I say, I hope this somewhat justifies the use of only one type of conjecture to mean so many overloaded things. Um, so we'll also talk about conduction, I guess. Um, so. The first thing that we want to explain is like how to form conjunctions and what counts as verification, right? So we need to start with the formation rule. Uh, so that says that if we know that A and B are propositions, A and B is a proposition. Uh, so this is a type constructor that takes two arguments, returns a new type. Um, and we can say, all right, so what counts as a verification of A and B? Well, we need a verification of A, and we also need a verification of B. Um, and again, we have immediately uh, the introduction rule, which is that if we know that A is true and we know that B is true, we know that A and B is true. Um, and so what this is, is just the tuple type, right? Uh, we have this data type and AB. Um, and we say it's both the data constructor A, B. Um, so the Formation rule is basically encoded by by the type constructor, which is and, and the um, the introduction rule is encoded by the data constructor, which is both. And you can see this, right? We have the proof of and introduction. Um, if we have a proof of a, I have a proof of b. To get a proof of and a b, all we need is to use this data constructor um, and apply it to both of our arguments, right? Um, so, like the elimination rules for conjunction, right? We need one on the left and we need one on the right. So, if we have that A and B is true, we should be able to conclude, <coughs> excuse me, should be able to conclude separately that A is true and that B is true. Um, and justification is that, like, if we have a verification of A and B, we just sort of deconstruct it into a verification of A on one hand and a verification of P on the other hand, and then we just take the one that we want. Um, so we can do this by pattern matching, right? We say 
for the left elimination rule, we say if we have both a proof of A and something else, we extract the proof of A. If we have both something else and a proof of B, we extract the proof of B. And uh, those are the elimination rules. So that's explained the, um, the meaning of, of logical conjunction. Um, okay. So now there's uh, destruction. Um, and just like before, we have to talk about the formation rule first, right? So if we know that A and B are propositions, we know that A or B is a proposition. It's the same thing. It's a type constructor with the same kind as uh, um, the uh, conjunction. Um, and to like say that it's a proposition, we have to tell you what, the, what we count as verification of it. And so a verification of A or B intuitionistically is either a verification of A on one hand or a verification of B on the other hand. So if I want to prove A or B to you, I'm going to say, all right, I'm proving A to you, and then I give you a proof of A. Or I say, okay, I'm going to prove B to you, and then I give you a proof of B. So this is just either, right? So we have this data type or PQ, and it's either a P or a Q. Um, so, hey, sorry, um, I'm, I'm just trying to catch up, but the, what's yeah. the, what's the elimination? What is the value of that? Like, what's the purpose of that? Uh, what does that mean? Right. So the idea is that, um, I guess I should have maybe said this up top, is that, uh, and this sort of goes back to like Gerhard Genson, um, and his work in, uh, natural deduction, but the idea is that we can, like, give the meaning of the logical constants um, by their introduction rules. So like uh, the meaning of, of and is just that we need to have both A and B to construct it. And then this both thing sort of lifts it into the and, right? Um, the meaning of the elimination rules is uh, is, based, is logical laws. So uh, Martin Lewis' talk was titled uh, on the, what is it, on the meaning of logical constants and justification of logical laws. So the meaning of the logical constants part is the uh, introduction rules, and the logical laws part are the elimination rules. Uh, I talked about this a little bit, like I mentioned, um, when we were looking at implication elimination. Uh, this is uh, modus ponens, right? So, um, like, if Socrates is a man, and if all men are, wait, no. If Socrates is a man, and if all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal, right? That's modus ponens. Um, and then there's also modus tollens, which is if Socrates, if all men are mortal and Socrates is immortal, then Socrates is not a man. Um, and we can prove that, actually, in pure script, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, um, oh, okay. So it's, it's just the simple logical yeah. um, um, op operators of the, the and yeah. and ors and such. So if you know A and B, then uh, you know A is true. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Excuse so me. Yeah, it's a way. It's a way of getting out of the logical constants, basically, to simpler things. Um, so again, for or introduction, um, again, these are kind of cool because these are like higher rank types, right? So um, I just wanted to point that out real fast. Um, so uh, the introduction rules for disjunction, right? If we know that A is true, then we know that A or B is true. And also, if we know that B is true, we know that A or B is true. Um, and the justification of that is that, like, we know that a verification of A or B is either a verification of A or a verification of B. And in either of the above cases, we have one of those things. So we can lift from a verification of A to a verification of A or B, or from a verification of B to the same. Um, and again, like the introduction rules here are, are just data constructors, right? So uh, you know, if you ex inspect the type of A, um, you have for all PQ, P implies or PQ. Uh, you can also like move that second one into this and it's a little bit more justified logically, um, but it doesn't really matter. Like the, the compiler will keep them the same, right? Um, in this case. Uh, so, the elimination rule for disjunction is like the most complicated one of these, right? So uh, we'll look at, I guess, 
to the English language version first, which is that if we know that A or B is true, and we know that C is a proposition on the hypothesis that A or B is true, which we're not going to worry about. Um, actually, I guess that sort of gets included in the higher ranking a little bit. But um, and so if we also know that C is true on the hypothesis that A is true, and we also know that C is true on the hypothesis that B is true, then we know that C is true categorically. So uh, and type, this looks like this, right? We have or AB implies for all C, we have A implies C, and then we have B implies C, except that these are actually, well, you can think of them as implications or you can think of them as hypothetical judgments. Um, because like I said before, uh, in this universe, there's no difference. Um, uh, but if we have both of these, then we can get C. So, um, yeah, so this is a little bit more verbose than our other stuff. So we're given a verification up top of A or B, right? So we'll call this proof disjunction. And I guess, like, we've, as you probably noticed that we've been prefixing all of these variables with proof. Um, and the idea is that, uh, you know, in the curry Howard correspondence, right, propositions, or types are propositions, and terms are proofs of those propositions. Um, and, uh, you know, a proposition is like the type of all of its proofs. So, um, we haven't really worried about that before now, but now we're actually like going to be operating on some stuff. So we have this proof of or elimination that we're going to define. But what it takes is a proof of the disjunction. So it takes a proof of A or B. Um, so we can pattern match on it, right? It's either got to be a proof of A, so it's got to be a proof on the right side, or it's got to be a proof on the left side. Um, if it's a verification of A, um, all we do is we say, uh, all right, well, um, we apply our knowledge to that uh, C is true on the hypothesis that A is true. Um, that's my mom bringing me my pizza for the, for the meetup. Um, I'm on vacation right now, so. Uh, anyway, uh, where was I? Um, yeah, so we have this like A implies C, right, that we can take. We also have a proof that B implies C, um, which we don't need to worry about in this case. So all we do is we apply our knowledge that C is true on the hypothesis that A is true to our proof that A is true, and we get a verification of C. The other case is like exactly analogous, right? Um, and so that concludes the, uh, the proof of or elimination. Um, so finally, we're going to talk about bottom. So uh, bottom is a proposition. Um, so we need to talk about what counts as a verification of it. And the thing that counts as a verification of it is nothing. You have no verifications of bottom. Like, it's never true, right? It's always false. Uh, so there's no introduction rule. We can only obtain a verification of bottom if we already have a verification of bottom. Um, so we can write that as new type bottom equals bottom bottom, right? This is void. <laughs> That's what this is, right? And we're using the same trick to encode it that uh, we do in PureScript. Um, there's also, but there is an elimination rule, uh, which is that if we know that bottom is true, which we won't, but if we do, and we also know that A is a proposition, then uh, we know that A is true. Um, this is a little bit harder to justify than the other logical laws, uh, but um, we can sort of do it safely because like, we know that we're never going to satisfy the conditions of this law. We're never going to know that bottom is true. Um, Merton Love says that he compares it to someone saying, I'll eat my hat if you do such and such, right? Where like the 
make sure you have slash and touches so that you'll know that you'll never have to actually go through with eating your hat. So you might say, I'll eat my hat if you can, I don't know, climb Olympus Mountains in your lifetime, <laughs> right? Like no one's gonna go to Mars and climb Olympus Mountains, right? Hopefully, probably. Um, so I can say that and be safe that I won't have to eat my hat. Um, so the way that this works is just like this is this is absurd. So the proof of bottom elimination. The idea is that if we're given a bottom, we can extract another proof of bottom from it by unwrap. Um, and then this type checks, right? It says that uh, you know we'll never actually know what the output of our type is. So from bottom, we can uh, infer or we can conclude any proposition, any type. Um, so you can read off that that implementation. Like if someone claims to you, comes to you and says, "Hey, I have a verification of bottom," you say, "All right, unwrap the new type constructor and give it to me, and I'll pass it up the chain, and I'll give it." Um, I'll give you back a verification of A. But the only thing you can get by unwrapping a verification to bottom is another verification to bottom, and you'll have to unwrap that. Uh, it'll go on forever, and you're like assured that you'll never need to actually produce your term of type A. Um, you can just, like, you'll just keep passing it up the chain forever and ever, and so you'll be good. Um, so, uh, intuitionistically, um, I guess we'll talk about negation, right? So we have a preposition A, we want to talk about not A. Uh, intuitionistically, all that is is saying A implies bottom, or A implies void. Um, so, like, yeah, um, I guess I'll justify that briefly, right? Like, we can, we can just we can uh, get the truth of any proposition if we have a verification of something that's false, right? So if we have a verification that A implies bottom and A is true, then we could easily get a verification of bottom, right? So we can never have a verification of bottom by definition. Like that's how we divide it. So based on that stuff, we can say, all right, um, this not A implies that A implies, or is equal to A implies bottom, um, because it behaves exactly like we would want not A to behave, essentially. Like, you can't be true at the same time that A is, um, and like, if it's false, it's essentially, like, if you say A implies bottom, you're essentially guaranteeing no one's ever going to be able to produce an A for me, right? Because um, if they could, I would give them back a bottom, and you're never going to be able to give something that has type bottom. So, um, yeah, I guess like you can ask, well, all right, we have this system of logic. Is it consistent? And so what Martin Lewis says is that, yeah, it's, it's obviously consistent, right? Because if it was inconsistent, we need to find a proof of bottom. But we don't have an introduction rule for bottom. There's no way to actually construct a term of type bottom without already having one. So um, he says this is like a, a pre-mathematical, calls it a simple-minded consistency proof um, for, for this calculus. And actually, um, you know, in his uh, various lectures and books and stuff, right? He also has um, broader systems that uh, extend this to the predicate logic and to, uh, you know, intuitionistic type theory, which also has notions of equality. Um, and he claims that sort of these meaning explanations also provide simple-minded consistency proofs of those, which is like much cooler because like propositional logic, consistent, eh, sort of boring, right? You don't need very strong, um, you don't need very strong assumptions to derive that. But like intuitionist type theory, the idea is that you could like do all of mathematics in it, or all of constructed math anyway. Um, and so like the idea that you can justify the consistency of it to yourself on like 
pre-mathematical grounds is pretty enticing. Um, so yeah, so uh, if we want to actually prove some stuff, right, like um, there's, uh, for instance, double negation reduction. So like an intuitionistic proposition logic, you can't actually go from not not A to A, but you can go the other way. Right? If you have A, you can go to not not A. Um, and so uh, like if you have a proof of A, um, what you can do is you can say, all right, we're going to constrict the lambda term, which is that if we have a proof of not A, um, we could apply it to our proof of A to get bottom, right? Because a proof of not A is a proof that A implies bottom. So if we have a proof of A, then a proof of not A would allow us to produce bottom, and so we can conclude not, not A. Does that make sense? Yeah, which uh, logic system uh, supports the not not A equivalent to A? So actually we can talk about, I have a little bit of that um, here. Is in order to get that, you actually need uh, well, classical logic, um, or classical propositional logic. Um, but it's classical propositional logic, and then th and then this is kind of a, a newer competing idea. Yeah. Um, this an intu intuitional. This is yeah, intuition. This, this is intuitionistic logic. Um, oh, prop okay. So uh, the other thing that that uh, classical logic validates the intuition of logic is allow the clue the middle, right, which is not A or A. Um, but um, you can prove uh, not not limb, right? Um, and I don't really want to walk through it right this second, uh, unless y'all want me to. But um, you can actually prove an intuition on stack logic that uh, double negation elimination and um, and the law of the excluded middle are equivalent. And I have proofs of them down here uh, that I haven't written out in English. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess like there's other things you can prove, right? Like you can prove the law of non contradiction intuitionistically, um, because like if you had a and not A, you would just apply the proof of not A to the proof of A, um, or proof of P to P, um, and then you would get a bottom. So you can say, all right, and A, not A, implies bottom. And so it's not true that A and not A are true. Uh, you can prove modus tollens, right? So if you have A implies B, and you have not B, uh, then you can get not A. And the idea is you have this proof of A implies B, you have this proof of not B, and you have this proof of A. Um, so what you do is you get, you have this hypothetical proof of A, right? And the idea is that we want to produce bottom. Um, so the idea is that you get a proof of B by using your proof that A implies B and your proof of A, and then you apply your proof of not B to your proof of B to get bottom. Um, And then there's also like uh, the intuitionistic law of the excluded middle, which is just not not the law of the excluded middle. Um, so the idea here is that if you have a proof of just not the law of the excluded middle, we want to produce bottom. Um, and like if we de-sugar the inside knot, the one on the inside. Or, no, sorry, this this not. Um, we have a proof of bottom given a proof of P or not P. Uh, and you do some tricky stuff to get a proof of not P. Because if you had like a proof of P, you would um, use your proof of not the lot the excluded middle to get a proof of not P. Um, and then you apply that, you apply, you prove the not win again to get uh, your, uh, your bottom that you wanted. So, uh, can yeah. I ask you about that law of non contradiction again? Can you go back up there? Yep. So, if contradiction was allowed, then you could define a function 
type and a not yeah. a right but but because contradiction is not allowed um, then you have to kind of wrap that in a not and then it's and then it's possible to define implement. Right. so yeah if we were to like desugar this totally right it would look like you unwrap that not I'm gonna unwrap that not. right this is pretty straightforward at this point so the idea is that if we have both a proof of A and a proof that A implies bottom. All we need to do is like apply the one to the other, and we can get a proof of bottom. Mm. Um. So yeah. So that's basically it. Um. There's a. You know, there's a few places you could. To, um, thinking about like, taking this exploration, right? Um, you can go into like modal logics, um, and I guess the there's like that famous uh, I don't know actually how to pronounce his name, Moji or Maki. Anyone does anyone know how it's actually pronounced? Um, I guess not. But uh, his paper on on like monads, right? And the idea there is that basically monads are just like a way of encoding modal logics. Um, so there's like a paper on mean explanations for modal logics that you could. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, the other thing is like sort of you could like uh, actually disambiguate these these function type constructors um, into different things for. Echo judgments and implication and then separating premises from conclusions and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I don't know. The other, I guess you could also like redo this in address and uh, do the um, stuff for existential and universal quantifiers. Um, but yeah, this this was just sort of. I, I saw that you were using the higher kind, higher rank types for uh, some of these. Yeah, uh, for sure. Groups. Is that uh, higher rank types? Is that how you, you define existentials? Like, ex um. Yeah. I can't recall. I think I think so. You can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can um, do yeah, we're not actually. In in this case, it's not this. It's not the same as existentials. No, I don't. I don't think so. So I guess like I'm not actually sure if any of these. Do you need to be higher rank? Um, I think in most cases it's just like a little bit more true to the logic, right? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think these might actually be like necessarily higher rank, but I would have to walk through them. Actually, let's see. No, right, because it's already got a. Let's like uh, take this out and see what it infers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this infer is just like a rank one type, so seems fine. Like, I think that it was basically just, um, I don't remember exactly why they decided that if you put the the quantifier right up front, it was a little bit less. Like, I guess part of it, right, is that um, for all a lob do the middle a is like. Actually, sort of a is actually sort of like a yeah, it's a higher order proposition, right? It's a it's a proposition in the propositional calculus. Whereas, like, if we um, you know did for all a b up front, just a little bit like less clear that we're moving between two two um. Two propositions in the propositional calculus. Mm -hmm. um, whereas here, it is I think a little bit more straightforward. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm still interested in the difference between the instant uh, intuition into interest logic and the uh, classical logic. Um, hmm. Like, is is one is are, are some applications requiring or just more suited to Classical logic, and um, well, I mean, 
if you're asking me that question, I would say probably not, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, that's controversial. Um, like, intuitionistic logic is nice because it's it's sort of the, the meta language of like constructive math and in computer science um, is sort of very naturally constructive. Like actually, I think the first uh, the first paper where Martin Lube introduces his many explanations is called Constructive Mathematics and Computer Programming, where he basically says they're the same thing. Um, but um, yeah, like the nice thing about intuitionistic logic in terms of it's it's got much more natural connections to to CS and to programming. Like the curry Howard correspondence says that it's basically the same as like the simply type lambda calculus. Um, whereas, like, if you try to get a Curry Howard thing for classical logic, it's something I think much more hairy. Um, I think you can do it, but it's just not as nice. Yeah, basically, type theory is based on intuition seed logic, and if you want to bring it to classical logic, it's going to be. I think people have tried that, but it never ended up like something very nicer uh, or usable. <laughs> I think, uh, and and also like, uh, yeah, I mean, the main part is the law of excluded middle, right? That's the like if you want to put pinpoint what the difference between the two is, that's where you get right. So, in in classical logic, you can prove if you prove that A is false uh, or that uh, sorry, <laughs> you cannot have both. Uh, uh, a is false and uh, like like A not A, right? Exactly like you see in the middle of the screen there, right? It's one or the other. Whereas in intuitive logic, it says no, no. If you want to know that A is true, you have to prove A is true. You cannot prove the uh, negation and then assume that, uh, like you cannot prove that A not A is uh, false. Therefore, A is true, basically, right? The uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm very <laughs> clear, but yeah, that's that's basically the the, the gist of it. Love excluded middle. Yeah, I was curious about that. I think that's yeah, a good start. There's a there's a talk on YouTube yeah. by uh Oh go ahead. By by Andre Bauer. Um, um and it's called uh, it's called Five Stages of Accepting Constructive Mathematics. And I think <laughs> the way that he puts it is that uh proof by contradiction is a little bit spooky. It's a little bit weird. Um and sort of like yeah. Um like like Vlad was saying, um like going from like Proving, proving that not A can't be true to saying that A is true is just a little bit uh, sketchy. And I think you know you can read sort of the history of why uh, Brewer thought it was a little sketchy. But um, yeah, that's sort of just going back into the history of it. But like I don't care that much about that stuff. Like I don't know when I did math, I didn't really. I wasn't like a constructivist. Like the nice thing is that it's just very well suited to computational applications because, um, like I said, you sort of have to construct things in computer science. Hmm, that's really interesting. I want. I wonder if at uh, some anyway, point in the, else, in the future. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Any, any any other topics you ask? Yeah, I was going to ask if anyone else had any other questions about this, but um, I'll eat this pizza at some point. So. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask uh, what you were planning on. Uh, were you planning on extending this to something else? Uh, uh, applying this to something else, or is this just purely educational? Yeah, like I said, I might try to introduce the idea of monads as including modal logics, or I might like rewrite all of this in Idris and actually finish the Martin Luth paper with the uh, quantifiers. Um, but I'm not totally sure yet. So that's yeah, that's or, or you know, some uh, yeah. put dependent types in pure script, and then I could <laughs> do it in pure script. Which part requires dependent types? Um. The existential and universal quantifiers. So, like, if we tried to say, um, like, what really requires dependent types, I think, is is predicates. 
so like if you want to say like exists um well so what you really want is like you want to say there exists a term of type a such that some predicate of a is true right but this predicate is going to take um a term of type a and it's going to produce a type so that's like already a dependent type notion does that make sense at least i think that's right yeah, I'd be interested to see it later. <laughs> yeah, I hope you come back with the follow up, uh, at least on the mo on the uh, modal logic one. Okay, I'll uh, work on that for sure. <laughs> I'll look into that. Okay, That's I'm a very nice. Thank you. Sure the, thank you for sharing this with us. It was awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I've always been curious about in, uh, asking some questions about intuitionistic logic. Well, I'm always happy to talk about it on Slack or wherever. So, <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah, we had a late start to this meeting due to scheduling uh, confusions, mistakes. So, I wonder if we should uh, stop the meeting uh, early today. <laughs> we we, I, I, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, content that people were going to talk about, so it might it might be okay to just stop the meeting here. It's also pretty late in in some some uh, so some of our time zones here. Yeah, I'm sad we didn't get to do the what's new in uh, pure script in the past month because there's been a lot a lot of uh, merges in the pure script repository, so. That's that's nice. It things like it seems like things are moving along towards. Uh, yeah, we're working uh, on making a um, release candidate for zero point twelve this weekend. Uh, <coughs> the flurry of things you're seeing going on at the moment is uh, attempting to get the compiler ready and all of the libraries having a branch where we are using you know have everything updated for the new the new compiler. So hopefully tomorrow at some point we'll have um, some kind of release for that. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah, that's super exciting. Thanks for letting us know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope it goes well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going pretty well so far. There, there's nothing really <clears throat> stopping us from doing it apart from just the sheer number of libraries that we've got. <laughs> um, plus, there's a few sort of problems we're trying to resolve in like uh, just some of the laws for some of the classes and prelude and things like that. Um, nothing like super major. We have some edge cases where like uh, modulo and division behaves weirdly. So um, Harry found a better description a while ago for, or a better kind of formulation a while ago that makes it more consistent and quite pleasant. So um, at the moment I've just been figuring out how we can make that work. Um, so there's a few things like that which take a bit more discussion to, rather than just like doing a straight update. But um, I think most of the libraries is just a case of, you know, renaming stuff as appropriate and taking effect rows out, things like that. So um, hopefully it'll be mostly smooth sailing once we get past these uh, questions about laws and such like. So yeah. That's nice. Do, do you have a, uh, like, has anybody written up a, hey, this is uh, like the normal things you will probably run into when upgrading? Because if not, then I could probably, like, if you, when you release the, uh, like, release candidate, I'm going to try it on a couple of report stories of mine and see what I run into. And, yeah, maybe write yeah, up some, hey. We, there isn't a write up yet, but um, definitely intend to do that, yeah. Um, I mean, most of the breaking changes are more to do with the libraries than anything in the compiler. Um, the main, there's a, there's a few compiler breaking changes, but the the most obvious ones will be things like removing effect rows from, well, switching over to use effect, which is F minus the rows um, and things like that. So yeah, those will be the most obvious. But yeah, we'll definitely write up a kind of description of, you know, what's added, what's broken and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Awesome. If we could figure out like an SED script, for converting F into effect for the most common cases, 
that would just do like most of the grunt work and then you maybe have to go in and fix like four or five leftover compilers where the formatting was a little weird. That might be well valuable. I'll leave that I mean, you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping this right full here. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you could yeah I was just going to say, right full is mentioning being a big fan of said. I think all good is actually mm. early. <laughs> One thing we haven't entirely decided what we're doing about is how AF is going to be updated yet. Um, the original thinking that Nate had was he was just going to we were just going to take the effect row off AF but leave the name the same. But I was talking to him the other day and suggested maybe we don't want to do that for the same reason that we didn't just take the row straight off F, which is if there are you know, blog posts and such referring to AF, it makes it more obviously wrong if you, uh, if you if we change the name of the thing as well when we when we do these updates. So possibly we're going to do the you reuse the PureScript IO uh, library, which at the moment is basically a new type around AF that might become what AF currently is, but minus rows. But yeah, I don't know. It depends what Nate has time to look at, and you know, so on. That's one thing that's not. So certain, but it's not in the core libraries anyway. Although almost everything depends on it. <laughs> core libraries, so yeah, I was about to say. It'll need figuring out soon. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have way more code with F effects and F effects. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gary, have you shown mode to anyone yet? Uh, not really. I mean, I threw it in the Slack channel, but I've not demoed it or talked about it, apart from there was one issue on PureScript spec, I think, which someone was asking about. And I pointed out it might be useful then. But no, I've not really uh, talked much about it. Do you want to? Yeah, I was thinking about maybe doing that, but I'm not sure if I actually because you've got your CLI project that's pretty neat as well for that. So. Yeah, that's what I was going to show. I mean, the mode library itself, that's your thing. Um, I'm not sure if I'm... Yeah, but it's pretty small. I mean, there's not a huge amount to explain. It's just... I mean, the API was, yeah, the API was pretty pleasant. OK, so yeah, so I, I think that... that's... To everyone else who doesn't know what we're talking about right now, uh, Moat is a library that I made for basically describing test suites, but it doesn't actually have any ability to run tests or do anything at all. It's basically a, a, a kind of bunch of free monadic things that is just there for like describing uh, tests and groups of tests and sort of adding before and after hooks for them and stuff like that, um, with the idea that you can interpret it into whatever you want. So at the moment, like the examples it provides, you can you, you can define tests for it and then you use them either in pure script spec or in pure script test unit. Um, but we're kind of doing some more stuff for that and kind of start another project which kind of uh, lets you filter the tasks that you want to run and stuff like that. Kind of, uh, um, the, What's the library we use in the Haskell library we use, uh, Christoph? Uh, currently Tasty in the yeah, compiler. So, but um, so I think maybe he's got something to show for that at the moment. Yeah, just cloned it. I'm installing. Wait, maybe I can just share my screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I shall share my screen. Can you see this? Yeah. yeah. All right. So this thing is online in. Um, yeah. It's the rare library by Christoph. <laughs> yeah, it's a library by me. I don't usually write libraries. It's but the only one. But I mean, you got PSA ID and stuff. But libraries yeah. aren't your. Uh, I don't blame you. It's a lot of work. I, I build applications, yeah. I'm not really like, I don't think in libraries. I don't know. 
can't I can't build reusable blocks. I just build like I put blocks together. I don't build blocks. Seems like to me. Okay, so I'm just gonna see if this works. I think I might have a wrong compiler version on the path. We'll see in a second. Because I did something on master, I think. It might still compile. No, it doesn't. OK, maybe not. Yeah, there's stuff with F and yeah, yeah, yeah. none. OK, it's more so. Uh, yeah. Wait. Um, maybe I can do something. I'll just delete that one. And then. <clears throat> Should have okay. So this does specify a compiler. So maybe now it works. Uh, I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna clean out the output first because I don't trust the compiler to figure all that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I can talk about what the idea is here. Okay, so with moat, um, so the whole reason for why I'm so happy we have this library now is that I like to do things like have my tests specified in files so that I don't have to recompile my tests every time I want to change some, like add a new test case. And so what I'll do is I'll have my test read a file and build a bunch of test cases out of some CSV in that file or something. Um, but the problem is with um, with PureScript spec and PureScript test unit is that they only uh, they don't allow you to perform effects during the construction of the test tree. So if you want to do the thing where, where you read files and you can only have like a single test. And that will contain all your like subtests that you read from the file. But if any one of these fails, it's just going to say that block failed, basically. So you can't say, maybe I think I have an example in here. So maybe I should just show that. So if I go in here. Let's run it. Yeah. So I have a test file in here where I have a couple of lines of strings. Uh, I guess I could zoom this up because that would probably help. Okay, <laughs> let's try this. And then uh, what I'm doing in the tests, uh, is <clears throat> that I have this suit here, over here, right? Now what I do is I have I say I have a test group and that test group is called generate from file. And then what I do is I read that file, the one I just showed you, I split it by lines, and then I make a test per line. And what that looks like is if I just run this thing. Right, so this is gonna run the tests. Okay, so yeah, I have one in here which fails, but what you can see is that there's a set uh, suit here, which says it's generated from a file, and then it's, it has like one test for every line in that file. And if one of these would fail, it, only that one would fail, basically, instead of where in PureScript spec currently, the entire thing would basically fail because you can't make like four subtests from a single file. Okay. <clears throat> and so the way the moat library gets around this is by having by letting you work in two different monads, where one is the monad that you use for constructing the tree, and the other one is where you, like, what you interpret all, all of the uh, these tests into. And so I have this interpret function here, which turns this into, which goes from a plan into a test suit, which is the type of, like, the test suit for the PureScript test unit project. Right, and I didn't actually write this, Gary wrote this, but basically it turns tests into test unit tests, tests that should be skipped, and 
yeah, the like tree like nesting, it uses the, the suit type from, uh, from the test unit library. Um, let's see, yeah, so this is where we turn the tree into the test that we end up, uh, end up running. But for the construction of the tree, that's the thing that runs in a different monad, which I've fixed to be f in here. Right. So, and then I wrote this library, which is the runner thing, which is this, has this function which gives you a CLI. And so what I can do now is I can say, um, I can pass arguments to that. So this is the test, this is running that, the file basically, this one is running the main function. And I can, for example, pass it the dash dash list argument, which instead of running the tests is going to just create the tree of tests that I'm, I'll end up generating. And then it just shows that instead of running the tests. And so I could use that to, well, it, I mean, other tools could make use of this. Or if I just want to look at all the tests there are and I want to pick one of these, I can just do that. What's an example of a line in the CSV file that you would use? So well, I have one here which just has lines basically. But what I could do, like what I could think of is, for example, I could have this kind of format, right? Where I say I separate my test cases like this. I could have an ad hoc format, right? And then I could say uh, I have an input of 34, 24, and I expect like a result of. Uh, and then I have another test case, which is like, if I input 26, okay, let's do a multiplication function. To make so <laughs> I could have a thing where I have a title, like a format where I have a title, and then I have a number and another number, and I have the result of multiplying these, right? And then I mm -hmm. could just do more and more of these, and I could use that to then generate a bunch of test cases, like tests. And I don't have to recompile my test suit whenever I want to change something. Right when when I want to add a new case, I just add one of these lines instead of having to change my test suit. And I mean, there's more. There's like a, one of the cases that we have and had in some data. We have uh, serialization, and we want to make sure that formats we serialized in the previous version can still be read into the application even though we upgraded. So we needed to test that there the migrations worked out. And so <laughs> what I did was I just wrote out all the, uh, I just wrote out one file which contains every entity we had in the system um, for every version. And then I checked in the test that I could still read that back in and have that parse as a model of the newest version of the application. And we use it in the thing on the compiler as well, like in PSF yeah. itself. Um, we have like a whole bunch of JavaScript files that either are supposed to, to run successfully or they kind of like expected to throw a warning or an error of a particular type, which yeah. we by reading code and then examining the, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, so this is one, ex one example, for example, exactly. So we have a bunch of files in here and it would be super tedious to inline all of these as strings into a Haskell file and recompile whatever you want to add a new one or change them, right? What we do instead is we generate all the test cases from the like reading this directory, and then for every file we make a test case. Right. Is that how the is that how the compiler works right now? How the compiler tests, yeah. This is how okay. the test suit for the compiler is set up. So a single t a single like unit test would parse one of those files and. Uh, it will compile one of those files and run it and see that it works. In the, if, if it's the passing directory and the failing directory, it will try to compile this and it expects an error. Right? Oh, parse, that's how that works. Right. And I mean, basically every compiler does this. So if you check the Rust compiler, for example, they have exactly the same kind of thing. They are, they are a bit more sneaky where they inline the errors and say, like at what line it should point and that kind of stuff. We could get sneaky with that as well. But yeah. All the compilers do this. Anyway, so, <clears throat> and then this mode, mode T CLI thingy, uh, it's basically, it's pretty simple. So it supports the list thingy. It also supports a pattern argument. So I can pass it a pattern argument and I can say, I only want to run files underneath this group, for example. So I take this group, um, I pass this as an argument. 
then what it's going to do is only going to run these tests. Right, or it could say, I only want to run the A1 test or something, right? And so pass that in, and <clears throat> it's only going to run that one test. <laughs> what? That's amazing. Yeah, well, that, I mean, it didn't work, but yeah. Other than that, it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, let's try. Oh, I mean, yeah, I'm a. Uh, it did I work. Yeah, it has been working. <laughs> yeah, I think I wrote um, And the, yeah, the motivation for only running like one or a subset of tests is like sometimes the tests are really slow or you want to take a while to initialize and stuff like that. So if you're just working on fixing one particular bug, you can just repeatedly run the same test over and over rather than having to deal with it running the whole test suite. And then once you're done, you can run everything again at the end, sort of thing. Because at the moment, like on Slum Data, we have like these integration tests that run in the browser and do all kinds of stuff. And they take, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes to run or something. So it's really tedious to wait through all that if you just want to check that, you know, one particular aspect has been fixed by whatever it is you're working on. So with this, we can just say, oh, just run the test I care about. And then, yeah. Sometimes when it's built. Yeah, I mean, one um, another another motivation for this kind of like because the, <clears throat> the workflow that is enables, for example, is if I want to develop a feature, uh, what I what I do a lot of the times I write a test that will fail, and I say once I'm I have any idea of what like I want this to pass, so that I have like the roughest version of this feature that I could think of. So if I do like a find user just one. I make like the simple file which has a single usage in it, and I say once once this once it finds this usage, I have something that I can then test more rigorously, like rigorously or, or think about. And so, if I just develop against that one test, and I know it's going to fail every time, and until until that thing like passes, I don't want to run anything else because I know I'm not in a position where anything else makes sense until that one passes. Basically, that's one of those workflows that I do a lot. And, this kind of thing helps with that. I love how this um, this stream has gone from like here's uh, intuitionistic logic to here look like the most concrete thing you can do is just like oh run some tests and stuff. <laughs> it's quite a nice uh, contrast. Yeah, from proofs to hey, let's run some unit testing. Yeah, <laughs> from actual proofs to kind of like pseudo proofs. <laughs> I don't know, I that up. <clears throat> well, I can show you the type for the function. Basically, this thing has only a single entry function, uh, which is this one. Uh, okay, look, we're going to look at the simple one because that one is basically takes the same arguments as the other one. It's just a little simpler. Um, and so this is the function that interprets from that plan into This thing was the thing that turns a plan into a test suit. So you can use this to turn to either turn like run a spec test suit or a test unit test suit. And the hope is that at some point these libraries will provide that function instead. So we reverse the dependency basically. And then you just give it a test suit, and it, that's basically every all you have to pass to it. And at that point, it will give you like this CLI. Yes, it like wraps your test suit and gives you these like convenience, convenient help things. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, that was a pretty simple project. If you want to look at it, I'd encourage it. It's also nice because it's 100% PureScript because we have an op parse library for PureScript now, which I'm really grateful for. Um, so if you happen to write CLIs in PureScript, look at PureScript Applicative. This is what I used for that. And it's like super simple. I mean, I, I just have the two, two options at this point. But it reads a lot like uh, um, OpPars Applicative in Haskell. Uh, yeah, if you write CLI tools, check that out, definitely. You can finally get rid of the NPM dependency on the arcs. 
Okay. Oh yeah, the arcs. That's the other one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not heard of applicative. Yeah, the commercial is right that one. So. I think it was only just published on actually published on Bower and stuff earlier. Yeah, it was on. He wrote it a while ago because I kind of. I think I kind of bullied him into doing it. No, I didn't bully him, but I think I kind of nerd snapped him with it. And it's super cool because it even like it even allows like it uses row types to to let you do things like specify sub commands, right? Where you have like git clone and git push and git pull or whatever. Oh, it that's supports cool. that. It supports that stuff, right? So you can say command more seconds. So this would be like clone and then Maybe this would be, sorry, this would be like remote and then this would be show. Then you could have more here, like remote add, remote. And whatever. does it su support the dash dash help command where it'll kind of print out all the options? I don't, I don't think it does that yet. No, I checked it out and it didn't work, didn't do that yet, but I'm sure he's going to accept a pull request mm -hmm. if you feel like making one. Yeah, that's that for me. I figured it would be a nice thing to show. Yeah. That's really good. Applicative. I mean, yeah, the pattern language is super silly right now, but we can always extend that to be something more regex-like, <clears throat> which is what the tasty library for Haskell, for example, does. And just pick the simplest thing that could work for now, and then improving upon that is always a possibility. But well, the hope was that if it's simple, it's it's going to work. But as we just saw, that doesn't work out as well. It's probably my fault. <laughs> uh, I think I might have done some stupid. Eh. Oh, you named the module Commando. Oh my goodness, that's great. <laughs> is that in the op pass? Is it? Yeah, uh, op op to op to op licative. Op licative, yeah, yeah. No right. dot Commando. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, any other topics? I've been kind of out of the peer script scene myself for <laughs> a few weeks. Yeah, that's some stuff to try out for everyone. Gary, do you think we're going to make the release candidate this night, or do you think it's, it's a Sunday thing? I would imagine it'll be on Sunday now. All right. <clears throat> I don't actually Else? know we need much to go else to go in the compiler. There's a PR of Nate's to do the lax thing, but um, I think Liam was going to have another look over it before. Or maybe it's, I mean, I approved it, but it's not being merged yet. But, um, and that's probably the only required thing in there. Now, I think maybe I don't know. I have to have a look at the issues again. We're we're basically there though, because mostly we've been working on libraries, so that would just kind of point to the fact that there's not much on the compiler at least. Yeah, I think. Okay, so the one you opened with the modulo inlining stuff, that's probably going to go in. Yeah. Oh yeah, good point. That one does need to go in because at the moment um, the test breaks on. <laughs> new thing I've opened because the compiler is overriding the actual implementation with <laughs> yeah. the inline version. Right. <clears throat> oh, it's erroring though, so I need to do something more. And then... All right. Now I'm going to look into getting more of these PCI stuff. <laughs> because now that all the like intermediate PRs are closed, suddenly the change sets are a lot smaller. Right. Um, 
yeah, and I'll see if there's any other warnings that I can get raised off before we do this as well. Because there's one. I mean, two. yeah, it's not a big deal if the release candidate doesn't have all of these changes because yeah, that's, that's a good point. That it's not important for that at all. It's only the things which are actually going to be breaking that matter. Yeah, that we want to make sure it work exactly. And I mean, I guess one thing people could always do is just take contrib and start making 0 0.12 branches there as well. Yeah, I think we, there's probably in, too much in core that is still undone yet, but that's definitely something that will be uh, possible soon. Because we don't even have like either isn't done yet and stuff. There is a issue which is tracking the um, libraries that we have in progress. Yeah. So. I mean, at least now we can just say we don't care about the ordering. Right, if we just make a branch for everything? Yeah, I mean, the branch, you still need to sort of do the branches in the right order, but yes, the ordering is not super important. Um, I should have just run and figured out. I had a script that used to figure, figure it out, but the, because we were moving things around, like changing some of the hierarchy, mm -hmm. symbols and type level related and stuff, uh, I think the ordering wouldn't actually be accurate anyway, which is why I didn't, um, didn't apply it this time. Yeah. Plus, I missed a couple of modules out because like F isn't in that list because it's like not required to be updated right now because we're replacing it with effect in all the other situations anyway. Yeah, we're probably going to move it out of core anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I mean, we just stick it in contra or whatever. Yeah, that's what I think. That's what I thought. Yeah. There are a few just things that be deprecated actually, I guess, because uh, Liam was saying we should move symbols into the type level prelude. Monoid doesn't need to exist anymore because it's included in prelude. Inject is probably not going to exist as a library of its own. It's going to have classes included, like with uh, the co products in functors and either. So there's a couple of these which actually are in this list which are going to be, you know, shut down anyway, I think. Mm -hmm. That sounds good to me. Yeah. I was thinking of if if there if there might be reason to make like a small testing library which is one hundred percent FFI and pre that we can safely depend on from anything for def dependencies without creating cycles. Well that's what the assert library is for. I mean it, I, apart from the fact that the point it depends on F or FFI. Yeah. Okay. Um but for most of the libraries they can like basically everything below pre should be able to use that one. Mm -hmm. Because um, that's kind of what it was intended for, but it, the assertions it has is just like it just blows up. It doesn't have a good error messages or anything like that. <laughs> um, we could, could always make that a little nicer, right? Yeah, um, and Prelude has its own sort of pure FFI testing thing, but you have yeah. to trick Pulp into running it because it's not using F; it's using almost F. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a thunked uh, like function thing. So yeah. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, that's a good point. We'll have to update Pulp after this as well, because at the moment it's now looking for F rather than effect for its uh, entry point checking code. So. Yeah, that's true. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we should probably allow both for the time being. Yeah, yeah. It just needs the, the support for effect, I guess, rather than yeah. having to override it with an argument for every uh, every project like we have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit to do, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I would very much like 0 0.12 to be a thing which people can use soon, given how long it's, this cycle has taken. Yeah, I think I think we're in a good place as well now. Um, I'm quite excited that the errors will actually be working, some of them now, the ones that were previously hard to find in editors. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of... It's only a minor thing, but it's one of the things that I'm most interested in. Yeah, it's <laughs> a huge usability problem. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the type error messages for the row stuff should be significantly better after this as well, because some of the um, those classes are being moved to being solved by the compiler, so they don't have, like, a bunch of machinery going using all kinds of different other classes, they'll just have, they'll be solved directly. So the error message you get won't be like revealing 
internal details that is only a implementation detail of the actual problem. So, so for yeah. our people like Justin who love their road trickery, it should uh, help, help. Although I'm sure he's used to all of the problems that <laughs> arise from that already. So you're gonna have five usages and faster, faster compilation. You just look at what's what's in there actually. It's less than I remember. Like I thought there was more stuff in there. In the actual, you mean in this release? Yeah, I'm just looking at the com like the commits in zero eleven. Because we made that eleven point seven that wasn't like zero point twelve has really been in progress since eleven point six. Um, oh, I see. But then we kind of were like, this is taking super long, so we released. Um, the other one as an intermediate release. Uh, so there are some things that went into there that, you know. Oh, I see instance chains weren't even in the list. Okay, they were probably before that. Oh yeah. no, instance chain should be in there actually. So maybe there's just something wrong with the ordering and maybe the way the branches were merged, it was. Uh... Yeah, I think it's, it's it was shown. I don't know, I know instance chains are in the compiler now, so that's fine. Yeah, exactly. Can't wait to see uh, what damage is going to be done with those. <laughs> oh God! Yes. Yeah, we should definitely get uh, try to get as many like people to compile as much pure script as possible with the new compiler with the RC. Yeah. Well, we're st hopefully we can use it for our new project as well. So we'll have a pretty good idea just from working with it. How, uh, how ready it is. That's going to entail updating a lot of libraries in core, uh, in contrib or other way. So I was yeah. hoping we, I was hoping we could get the Habita folks to try it out, and then they will fix all of it. <laughs> I think they might be a bit behind us because they're probably in the same situation that we usually were, where we've got such a massive code base that it takes us months to update. Um, but yeah, yeah, just as right, um, package sets could be. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Like, we can probably release a package set with the release candidate. That means that we don't need to actually release all of the, you know, make the actual releases for all of the libraries until yes. we're ready to do it. So having a package set that is actually going to be really great. Um, yeah, people can just keep adding to to that. Yeah. Yeah, at least for my work code, I'm going to use the package set. And yeah, at least I'll update my code as fast as possible because I use rows everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, Justin, by the way, you let me astray, but I tried using partial and I canceled one of these bundles. And that it already had its cache corrupted. I was spinning forever whenever I tried to bundle. So, yeah, parcels cache is mostly useless. You have to use no cache usually. Screw you and your JavaScript <laughs> tools. Oh yeah, didn't you say you had something to talk about earlier, Justin? Or was that just something that you kind of interested in? Not um, I mean, it's not really. Very interesting. Like my blog post that has everything in there. So it's like you, know, you just install Parcel, and then if you use React Basic, then if you add a Babel RC with the plugin, uh, it like just works because it's such a hacky package. Like it hot patches uh, all your React JavaScript. But yeah, and then on top of that, I and after that, like if you use PSE IDEs tools, then it's like. 200 milliseconds per change. That's like pretty nice. That's cool. Yeah. So it's that like everybody keeps on asking about it. So yeah, it's like it's these good. are my two domains, like using parcel and root types everywhere. Did you have any luck with your hiring in the end, lad? Or um, 
not so much. Yeah, not no, not so much. We <laughs> actually haven't found anyone yet. So yeah, still looking. But we're we're, we're just, I think we're kind of giving up on finding somebody that already knows function, and we're looking for people who would be able to look at the existing code, C sharp and TypeScript, and uh, that are willing to learn functional, right? Pure script. So we're going kind of the other way around. Okay, you don't know, but if you want to learn, at least then <laughs> we're gonna try to teach you. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the pool of people that that's a possibility is probably much larger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope so. And also, like, there's a meetup in like uh, a meetup group in like functional in Bucharest that I see they they've been up since 2010, so eight years, but they haven't done a meeting in maybe uh, I don't know like since the last year. And uh, the the guy organizing it just messaged me because he saw like some of my tweets and stuff like that. He said that they want to restart doing that, so hopefully I can meet some people there and maybe help organize future meetups uh, around here. Uh, actually, I'm, I hope I'll be presenting in May and I'm probably going to do something on, about on PureScript, maybe even Halogen, like show people, hey, look, Halogen is cool. You can do apps relatively easily if you, you know, something like that. Cool, yeah. We have a meetup in uh, Manchester here that I've never actually presented at. And it's, <laughs> I keep thinking like, oh, I should definitely do something for that, but I've never uh, managed to get around to it doing anything like that myself either. But, um, Becky, who works at Slam Data, uh, gave a talk on Halogen there, and that was actually how she got hired at Slam Data, because I saw her and then mentioned to uh, John, the John DeGos, um, that I'd, I was going to this thing, and he was like, oh, cool, pass the details on. <laughs> like. Two weeks later, she got hired. Um, but since then, I don't think there's been any pure script talks. People uh, mainly seem to be more uh, like closure users and things like that. But uh, so we'll have to bring back some types and put <laughs> them away. Yeah, I think most people at this meetup do Scala, but uh, I, I know there's been a lot of talks uh, like in the previous years on, on about Haskell and uh, st things like that. So I think people are open to listening to stuff to like. Uh, Pure, about pure functional languages, so hopefully there'll be some people who want to learn about pure script. Yeah, exactly. Actually, there was one talk I went to where <laughs> someone was like, hey, uh, let's compare Perl 6 with Haskell. <laughs> like, trying to follow uh, Haskell like idioms in Perl 6, and uh, people were interested in that, and I was just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it, it was interesting, but I, I was, yeah, it was horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> What if Haskell had more infix operators? <laughs> Not only that, but he was using some crazy hacks that made it kind of uh, made some of the rules more appropriate for like emulating Haskell. So he was like, "Oh, and if you use this like you know piece of nonsense, then it changes the way that the program behaves, and it makes <laughs> this thing behave more the way that suits this." And I was like, "Oh man, sounds yeah. like her to me." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's really interesting, but it's not a language yeah. that I have any inclination to return to. There, there's some some of the dynamics and stuff in Ruby, which is just crazy, right? Where if you call. Oh yeah, I love that thing I've seen in Ruby, where it's like you can extend the, a class, which is random. The method missing one. <laughs> well, no, no, you can actually literally write. Is it? I think I think it was Ruby anyway, where you could say like you know this class extends, and then random selection from an array of different classes. <laughs> <laughs> It was done as a joke kind of thing, but oh. it was still it was like, that's uh, interesting. <laughs> you should that's just awesome. your program somewhere. So like 50% of the time it randomly extends one class. And, yeah. That would be as cool to, to give to QA to test. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You just make it like 99% of the time it chooses the right one and you know leave that in there as something so that like people can keep back, come back to you and be like, oh, I can't fix this bug. <laughs> Yeah, the one, the one neat thing about uh, Perl that I find nice, or uh, is that their their literal, like their number literals, um, they're very easy to do fractionals, so that you can keep precision. Um, like the only literal in pure script is like float and int, and if you start doing float math, then you'll start getting more wrong numbers with more decimal points, but. Um, like if, if you just if, if, if you had fraction like if you just had your primitives get put into a, some fractional data structure 
and then you'll never lose precision. So that's 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 one thing that's kind of nice about uh, Pro. Yeah, Scheme does that as well, or at least um, Racket does. It's pretty interesting. It kind of does like symbolic stuff where if you give it fractions, it preserves the that information. You can do imaginary numbers and all kinds of stuff with it. It's uh, pretty clever. But I no, I mean like. I was like, oh, this is cool. I want to do this in JavaScript. And then I started thinking about how that would be possible. And nah, this, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day about how you might do that in PureScript in an extensible way. Um, we would need overloaded literals as part of that, I think. Um, so you don't have to write them in a convoluted manner. Um, I guess you could probably do some stuff with like uh, proc simple proxies, but yeah. It would definitely need a runtime though, right? Because. Uh, realistically, JavaScript just doesn't have fractional, so you need to compile it to something. Yeah. Um, Unless you do all the symbolic stuff in like a super compiler, and then you just emit floats at the end of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it so, could be some interface, I guess. Well, I, I, I kind of feel like it gets into the dependent types realm. I still mean to return to the precise library as well, um, which is arbitrary precision rather than you know symbolic, but um, it's something that I started working on or like looking at about a year ago is trying to improve its behavior. But I mean, I don't know. There's a, the, there's a, the fixed precision library that um, Lumi, like Phil, basically released, which relies on uh, JavaScript implementation for big numbers and stuff. But um, I wonder if maybe that's just more sensible than trying to do the whole thing in JavaScript, because I would imagine it's going to be incredibly slow, the version that I was working on. Um, but most of the time, we only needed it to represent numbers, not to actually perform arithmetic on them, uh, apart from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, simply. Yeah, the, uh, the awake folks were doing some precise libraries as well, what well, precise dates, but I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. I think it's based on the same using the JavaScript big int thing. I see. Something. But um, yeah. I mean, you just want you want that code to be as VM friendly as possible. Yeah, yeah. Just a shame. That. I also just wanted to understand like the process of how you would actually write those things. Like it was a, as much to me. It was interesting trying to figure out how you actually do, you know, that kind of arithmetic because um, it wasn't something I'd ever really looked into before because my CS education is non-existent. <laughs> I don't think it's taught in CS, but uh, I know there are different methods for multiplication. That yeah, maybe it's not, but it's the, it's the kind of thing that you know is one of those deep CS algorithms, which is more likely to your encounter when you're doing that kind of stuff than yeah. Uh, than when I mean, you're there's there's tons of trade-offs. There's always the constants versus the asymptotics, and you kind of have to decide how big you assume the numbers are going to be that you get. I had an interesting idea once for, um, like, before I worked on PureScript, when I was working on a language with another friend, when we really didn't know what we were doing. I mean, now I have some idea at least, but <laughs> back then it was just like everything was new and we were just trying all kinds of stuff. We had this idea that the language would be able to um, choose optimization strategies based on, like, when you do a compilation, you can define a test suite and the compiler would actually run the tests and then, like, figure out like, oh, according to these tests, then this is the hot areas of the code or whatever and, and apply optimizations as necessary. <laughs> but um, the thing is that's only gonna work as well as your tests actually reflect real life. So it's kind of one of the similar problems to trying to figure out, you know, based on your usage, whether how something should uh, should be optimized, like what's the, which is the trade-off to go with. So like a tracing JIT just at compile time. So on like compile, code yeah. that is not the code that you actually end up running. Well, basically, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the idea. Your tests would have to reflect a somewhat real use yeah. case. Yeah. But this was writing a compiler that was going to compile to ActionScript, which had a, basically, a, I mean, by the point that we were interested in this, ActionScript's um, virtual machine was not as good as any, anywhere near as good as any of the JavaScript ones. Um, so it was pretty primitive and kind of any kind of, it certainly they didn't get to tracing or anything like that. It, it did, it started off faster than JavaScript, but 
after a couple of years of people actually caring about that in the browsers, it got left behind woefully. Justin, when are you going to talk about perp? Perp? Uh, so when are you going to talk about, about perp? Um, I don't know if there's that much to say about it. <laughs> it's just a uh, Rust program that I wrote just because uh, compiling it is fast and easy. But other than that, I mean, I don't know. I'm not like so much a fan of Rust still. But yeah, it's like um, it's like a really uh, a really bad version of pulp, I guess. It just like doesn't support any options. <laughs> and, uh, it's mainly just to make things that I want done easier. So like one of the things that really bothers me in pulp is like if you add like flags like um, build or optimize or whatever, you get like different code paths that are like really hard to chase down. So at least this one is like supposed to be the, the simplest program or the stupidest program so that you can actually figure out like what command corresponds to what. And it has a like the skip build flag like everywhere. So like yeah usually I'm like using my ID tools and I just want to run something quickly. So just makes that easier. But yeah, I mean, I'm like I use it even at work, but not actually in the project. So I use it like myself, but then all of my npm scripts are uh, actual PSE package commands and whatnot. So yeah, I don't know. If anyone else wants to use this, then feel free, and then feel free to change it however you want. This is, this is just like I don't know, kind of an experiment, I guess. Yeah, I can see contributing. I just wasn't entirely sure what I like, kind of would help what the what the vision is like. How it's supposed to be different from pulp. Seems like it's very much con uh, conventional or configuration on another level than pulp, maybe. Yeah, um, but I like the idea that this would be like you don't need npm at all. Yeah, you don't even need a run node runtime, so. Yeah, that's yeah. one of my goals. I mean, it seems silly because like test is in here, and the like, test is going to require having a node runtime. But like uh, sometimes I've needed to just like build without having like node or anything, just to produce the browser bundle. Yeah, I just found. I, yeah, I, I just found that in my testing, even even just running. Um, Pulp build instead of just the purse com like the purse commando which does the globs right and pulp is not like it's doing a lot of computations just starting up node then like starting another process which takes like like that adds to two seconds of overhead and if these builds are just like I want to change one or two files then that's like a, like fifty percent of the build time. Yeah, there is like some kind of problem with that also. Yeah. The at least the glob implementations in Rust have been like pretty fast, so there's like some amount of like speed ups from just from that alone. Yeah, I've written a bit of CL like CLI stuff in Rust and it's been very pleasant in terms of speed and I also like using Rust. I'm not entirely sure about this like clap library. I mean, it's like the most popular, so I used it also, and it has a lot of the things like correctly wired, wired up, I guess. But it's like literally everything is extremely tight, so that part is so fun. Uh, there's like one layer on top of that, which is like structomt, which is a lot more like generics. I think this might be more up your alley. 
Oh, nice. I didn't even know there was something like this. I'll have to look at it more. Did you say that Rust compiles really quickly? Yeah, like fairly quickly. Not at all. No, 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 no. It's way slower than GHC. It runs very quickly, but compiler time. Well, that was a fairly contrasting <laughs> opinion. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you need. Like, I'm just compiling toys, so like they're fast enough. It, it might be that it was slow because I was pulling in an H the HTTP library. I don't know. Oh, yeah, there are, yeah. I've like tried installing some devs and just given up because like they were so bad. Like uh, the Rust, the cargo edit package, I can't even like install it correctly because like no matter what I do, the openness itself thing doesn't work. So it's like the Ruby problem in Nokokiri, but like 100 times worse. Man, yeah, um, uh, at least uh, I have like one more thing, which is my JS Union thing, which is like it's like a real terrible version of variant, I guess, in that like you just use these powerful functions for checking if something's actually the right thing. So it's kind of like an implementation of like TypeScript type guards in PureScript. So I don't know if anyone needs to do something horrible like working with chalk the JS library, then this could be useful for you. But otherwise, like, it's something to be avoided. Like, great advertisement from my own library. How would you feel about writing a JS bundler in Rust so we could skip all the webpack nonsense? No, that was kind of fun. Yeah, I thought so too. That's why I was asking you if you want to do it. I mean, I think even at that level, I would start just like saying that I just want to use Haskell because there's probably like a lot of actual operations I want to do instead of just plumbing. Like the only reason that I have this perp thing in Rust, other than just like making the compile and building uh, like really easy, is just that um, it only needs to do this like duct tape thing for glorified make file behavior. Like even just using the built-in like option and whatever is just like what is this bizarre land. That's a bit different. All right, I'm gonna head off. Um, yeah. See you later, everyone. See you later, later, Gary. Nice having you here. Yeah, and uh, I'll keep everyone posted with whatever happens with the release as well. Um, cool. See you later. Cool. See you later tomorrow. Oh yeah, I was messing yeah. around. With, I was messing around with Shake. Did anyone ever use that one before? Yeah, that's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'm thinking, I'm thinking I can maybe rewrite. Pure scripts like build manager using Shake, which would be pretty cool because then uh, <laughs> we didn't have to write the stuff that cache validates ourselves because that's hard. And so, if anyone has done anything with Shake before, please tell I everybody just, knows. I just use it as a make replacement. Oh, okay. simple, simple commands. Okay. <clears throat> now I use it to actually build like the dependency graphs between all the modules and selectively run the compiler. I think GHG has GHG uses Shake now internally. So that's the last I heard. Uh, well, they are still working on that, but yeah, but it's not GHC using Shake to implement its own dependency resolution. It's the build process for GHC being written in Shake. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. What I want to try to do is use Shake as a library to replace some of the code we have in the compiler, which figures out the dependencies, and instead let Shake do that. I mean. <clears throat> I'm also going to head out, just reboot my computer to play games. Yeah. Later, Justin. Right. See you. Yeah, See you as well. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Later, later, Christoph. Let me know what you find out about that shake thing. It's, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to look into it, maybe. maybe I'm, not use it, I'm not using it as a library. I use it as a CLI tool. Yeah. Well, I'll see. I'm going to see. Just yeah. Yep. Later, guys. Yep. Gonna head off as well. Thanks for hosting it. Yeah. Later.